Hi V, hi everyone else, welcome to Gaping Chasm. Today is a different sort of video in that you're not gonna see my face at all and the fan is intentionally going to be in the background so the audio might be a bit messy and there will definitely be a point where the audio gets really strange. I, I don't really have a quiet place to film this video and I wanted to get it out because I have a lot to say on um, on the topic of Artemis Fowl. So we're, we're just doing audio of myself and then I'll, I'll throw in like trailer footage or just pictures of my copies of the books or something. But yeah, I did watch the Artemis Fowl movie the day it came out and it was so much worse than I could have even sort of imagined. Well, I don't want to say it's the worst film adaptation or even the worst film I've seen this year because there are definitely winners for both of those categories, but um, this is just so bad and like disappointingly so. It feels like this is crazy conspiracy theory and I don't believe it for a minute, but it almost feels like Disney created the COVID virus so they would have a reason not to release Artemis Fowl in theaters. It's that bad, guys. It's that bad. Not gonna lie, I, for some reason, had high expectations for this movie. So I loved this book series back when I was in like I want to say fifth and sixth grade. I My original editions are super beat up. They're really well loved. You can tell that I not only read them a couple of times, but would like bring them with me everywhere. I actually got them at like, I got the first five as a box set through a Scholastic Book Fair, which we all know Scholastic Book Fairs are the best. I do, I actually have like one of the like companion books as well as book six and seven in the series I never finished the series I don't I think I just didn't realize there was like another book because this series is not great with like through lining um which I'll talk about in a minute but yeah I did I I, I loved the first five to death and I like book six and seven I don't want to make it sound like I don't but my fondest memories my most nostalgic memories are with the first five the these were the first books that ever made me cry over a character I don't think any other book had hit me so emotionally before it, it was book four i'm not gonna say who it was in case you want to read the books they're really fun they're really good i do recommend them for readers of all ages but specifically i would i looking at the like summaries again i, I don't know if they'll hold up for an older reader that doesn't have like that nostalgia factor if you know but they're really good books but yeah they, they were the first ones to make me cry over a character they were the first books that i remember actively like laughing along with and like interacting with in like a vocal way it takes a lot for me to be like talking to a book or laughing out loud at a book or crying at a book and these books hit all those marks so it was super it was it was a new experience for me and it was awesome and i still think fondly of the books in large part because they were able to just evoke such visceral reactions from me but all that being said, I only really remember the broad strokes of the story and not really individual plot points. I have since, like I've gone through and looked at more in depth what they're about thanks to like Wikipedia, but like based on my own memory of them, I don't, I didn't remember and I don't really remember the, the specific plot points. I do remember that Artemis is like the villain of the first book. That's not really disputable. He's not, he's not really an anti-hero. He's, He's got like anti-hero qualities, but it's more like he's a sympathetic villain, if that makes sense. And as the series progresses, he grows into a much better person, which is a large part of the intrigue of the book. And that's probably one of the real, only real through lines that the series has, uh, is, that, is that you're watching him not only grow up, but grow into a complicated, empathetic and sympathetic character. He's also clever. He's he really is a genius mastermind. He really falls into that stereotype uh, of like the brilliant villain. And it works, even though he's just 12 years old. Like it, 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 it's, it's a character trait that, that really works for him. And we, we not only get to see him scheming, but we get to see how complicated his schemes are and how they turn out and how every decision not only accounts for the repercussions, but it comes for like multiple repercussions and has multiple dominoes falling. Another like big intriguing part of the books, especially the first two books, which is what the movie is based on, is the fairy society and the fact that it's a much more technologically advanced society than human society. It's really cool. It's really fun to be able to play around with that and like to read about the characters interacting with that technology. It does it in like kind of the way that totally spies would do it or spy kids does it in that like they're given like gadgets that are just 
fun and cool. And of course, fairies themselves are pretty intriguing. They're, they're interesting. They're, uh, you know, they're fairies. I don't know how, why I would have to justify the fact that fairies are interesting. They just are. The biggest through line that the series has is the villain Opal Kaboy. She, I say, I say she's like the villain of the series, but it's more like she just appears the most as a villain and not so much that she's behind every villainous thing and pulling all, all the, the strings or anything. She does in, in the books where she's the villain. That's definitely a big aspect of it, but, um, she's not masterminding everything that happens in the book. She's not even relevant in book one. She's, she's, it's literally, it's like every other book, it's books two, four, six, and eight. She's like the major villain. I'm not even kidding. Uh, and in those in-between books, there are things that are introduced that later do come into play with her, but they aren't introduced with her. And she kind of takes advantage of them after the fact. So she's the closest thing to having a, a through line that the series really has uh, plot wise obviously artemis's and holly's growth them being the main artemis being the main character holly being the secondary main character um like their growths and their relationship is another through line but i mean of course it's a through line that's how books work <laughs> um plot wise that opal's really the only thing connecting it on a broad on a broad way and that's why it kind of makes sense that disney is trying to push her into this first movie uh, I get the sense that they wanted it to be a franchise. I think they've given up on it at this point, but at some point I think they wanted it to be a franchise. So they were like, yes, push in a major villain. So it does make sense that they'd want to, but, uh, and I, th and I think it could have been done successfully, but uh, it wasn't. I've been legitimately excited for this film ever since I heard it was happening. So like, I probably found out about it a couple years after having read the, f the first five books. And I remember being excited. And cause it's been, the a movie was announced is being in the works back in 2001 so it's it's taken a while to actually you know make it to the screen it's taken about 20 years and i i think it is a good book that could have made a really good film it it has a lot of visually appealing aspects to it and it's not the first book is not very long which means you could adapt the whole book into one movie <laughs> yeah disney uh decided to adapt the first two books into one movie uh by cutting out most of book two and just kind of adding adding opal and adding artemis's fa father and that's how they adapted book two i'm not gonna i'll talk about more in a minute but <laughs> my god this series i mean it's been popular with the young readers pretty much since its debut uh, the author, Owen Colfer, he's written a total of eight books in the Artemis Fowl series. Well, several companions. A lot of those companion books are movie related, but there are some that aren't, that like predate the movie. Uh, and there's also now a spin-off series featuring Artemis's younger uh, twin brothers. Uh, the first book of that just came out. I have personally no interest in that. Um, I don't even really have interest in finishing the Artemis Fowl series. I like my memories of it. I don't want to like taint it and return to it and be like, yeah, not as good as I remember, because I think it's not really a series made for older readers. There's also been two separate graphic novel adaptations of the series. The first uh, adaptation came back when the series was still being published by Puffin. They, you know, were what you would expect. And then we, once Disney got a hold of the movie rights as part of like the promotion, they started a new series of graphic novel adaptations. So besides writing Artemis Fowl, Owen Colfer has written uh, a lot of other books, both for children and older readers. Hey, Artemis Fowl is his best known series. I think it probably always will be. Uh, but he's he's had quite a bit of success with just his writing in general. He's also written some on stage productions, according to his website. They're all for, it seemed to be local productions, which I thought was pretty cool. Besides being excited for the film based on the books alone, I was also really excited because the trailer while it didn't look to be a good adaptation, it looked like it could be a fun kids movie. It had some Kingsman vibes, some Spy Kids vibes. It looked very pretty and very colorful. And it's directed by Kenneth Branagh, whom I love. I, I think he's a great director. I, his style is very much like glossy photo, but I'm, I'm into that. I'm really into it. And I think that he is a good storyteller. I'm going to have to, you know, readjust my thoughts moving forward but i think he's a good storyteller most of the time and to be fair so the trailer makes it look like it's not based off 
the books very much at all. And it almost looks like it's based more off the second book than the first book. This is misleading. The movie is pretty in line with the events in some ways of book one. Like it's definitely more in line with book one than book two. And I don't know why they used the trailer to make it look more like disparate from the books than it actually is. I'm not really sure what that what that tactic is called, uh, but it probably killed a lot of hype. You easily could have made the trailers look more like the book than the movie even was. And nope, they, they chose to go in the direction of making it look not like the source material. This movie was originally announced uh, back in 2001 by Miramax Films. And in 2003, a uh, screenplay was written and they claimed they were planning to cast actors, but it ended up in development hell until 2011 when a different director, still through Miramax, was announced. That director was Jim Sheridan, and he's actually received quite a few Academy Award nominations. Like, he's pretty talented. In July of 2013, Disney finally announced they were producing with the Weinstein Company, a movie based off the first two books. They ended up cutting ties with the Weinstein Company and Harvey Weinstein, obviously, after the whole scandal came out, and they've, you know, never reconnected. It's like a permanent cut, which is, you know, good for them. I don't, I don't even think the Weinstein Company touched the, the film at all. I'm pretty sure that was just like an early announcement and the movie didn't even go into production until after they cut ties. This, the, the movie they announced though is the film we got. Uh, they announced it was written by, Ken, or directed by Kenneth Branagh, which it was, and written by Connor McPherson, which it was. And like I said, I, I like Kenneth Branagh's work for the most part. It was originally going to be released on August 9th of 2019. And then it was delayed until May 29th of 2020 because of the Fox Disney merger. And the spot that Artemis Fowl had been given was actually changed to The Art of Racing in the Rain, which was one of the movies that was brought on by Fox. It was then again moved to June 12, 2020 for specifically Disney Plus because of COVID-19. The first trailer dropped in late 2018. Uh, so if you were like me, you probably saw the trailer and thought, oh, an Artemis Fowl movie. It's finally happening. And then it disappeared from like the face of the earth. And you were like, was that a fever dream? because that was my experience. I full on was like, did I, I had no idea if it was legit or not, because there seemed to be no talking about it, but obviously it was just because the movie was moved. As for the cast, and so, I mean, the movie was originally going to air in 2019. The actors, specifically Ferdia Shaw, looks the age. If they were ever going to release a sequel, they'd have to age him up because there's no way he looks that young anymore, right? Like, that's kind of a red flag and kind of makes me think they knew even back then it was not going to be a, a movie worth its weight. It, you know, like, they knew. They be knew. Ferdia Shaw played Artemis Fowl II. Colin Farrell played Artemis Fowl the first. And Nonso Enozi, I believe is how you pronounce his name, plays Butler. And Laura McDonnell plays Holly. Josh Gad plays Mulch Diggums, who I did not even realize was who was playing that character until I... <laughs> did like the bare minimum research for this film which is interesting because you think they'd want to a capitalize off of josh gad because he's you know popular and b like good for him for like low-key disappearing in the role at least visually that was pretty nice and then of course judy dench hot off her razzy win is playing commander root who in the books is actually a male character i liked that change i think that root works as a female i my big concern was that if they changed the character too much because they were changing like to a female but no i think that full on full stop it nothing changed except it was just judy dench playing root instead and I, it worked the character as much as can be said for this film she embodied the character of commander root as best uh, like as as the you know as good as any male character could have done the same. Or male character, any male actor could have done the same. I am going to attempt to review slash explain exactly what happened in this film. First of all, where does it rank among other Disney Plus movies? Definitely better than Stargirl. I'm gonna put it on the same level as Lady and the Tramp. Where Lady and the Tramp is like so boring, it's almost unwatchable. Artemis Fall is so nonsensical it's almost unwatchable so yeah they're both floating around that same category of you should probably avoid it but if you do it's not gonna kill you and like regarding comparing artemis fell to other bad movie adaptations was 
not as bad as Sea of Monsters, but not as good as Lightning Thief. And I don't, I mean, Lightning Thief at least can kind of stand as its own movie and not an adaptation. Artemis Fall can't really stand as its own movie. So what happened? Oh my god. First of all, it's got a frame narrative. And on top of having a frame narrative, it has a narrator narrating, sort of. And the movie kind of forgets that it's got a narrator. <laughs> but two-thirds of the way through, we just stop hearing Mulch talk. But it starts with a frame narrative, kind of, where we're seeing events that are going to happen later. And it's a bunch of news reporters at the Fowl Mansion, and they're just, like, talking about how, uh, how Artemis Fowl, the old senior, is, like, a huge criminal and it's like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Like, he's been accused of stealing, like, artifacts, including the Rosetta Stone, of all things, from, like, museums. Now, this is actually a cool setup, and I'm totally okay with Artemis Fowl Sr. being a criminal, because in the books, the or at least Artemis Fowl Jr., I'm gonna have to double-check if Sr. was a criminal, but Jr. is a criminal, and he would definitely do that kind of stuff. So I'm okay with them being criminals and stealing stuff, but this isn't ever confirmed or denied it's just kind of dropped and it's like I, you get the feeling that it's not supposed to be true because Artemis Fowl Jr. is like defending his father to Holly at some point he's like they're saying terrible things about him in comparison to her father who terrible things were said about but like actually is kind of a lie so I yeah I'm not really sure what they're supposed to be. It's also not, like, resolved, because, like, by the time the movie ends, we just keep going along the lines of, oh, yeah, he's a criminal. Like, the reporters, the world still think he's a criminal. <laughs> like, I don't know what's going on there. I don't know. And then we cut to Mulch Diggums, who is played by Josh Gad, and Josh Gad is using a horrible voice. I don't really know what he was trying for, except to disguise his very iconic voice. I don't know why you would cast Josh Gad as like anything in a Disney film at this point. So we cut to him and he's like talking to MI6 who have like kidnapped him because they're like oh you have something to do with like the thieves of all these things and he's like oh no 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 no. You see you should be asking about Artemis Fowl Jr. And then he starts narrating and he's like Artemis loved Ireland which is like okay I get that. Ireland's gorgeous. We're gonna see some really lovely shots. And then he's like, but Artemis hated school. He goes to school and he goes to therapy and it's really just used to show just how smart Artemis is, which is, I guess, good because as the film progresses, they don't try to make him continue seeming smart. Like, I guess he's clever-ish, but we don't get a... I don't know. There's not... Obviously, like, a regular 12-year-old couldn't have done what he did, I guess. There's nothing unbelievable about his genius. You know, the film doesn't do anything unbelievable. And then we get more where he's, like, at home with his father, and his father is telling him all about fairies, and it's unclear. Like, Artemis doesn't believe, I guess, but it's kind of unclear if he, like, rebels against the idea or genuinely enjoys learning about them. Like, he's very quick to believe, his, like, the stories later on. That's not an issue, and I'm okay with that. It doesn't have to be an issue. I think it's more interesting when we don't spend a lot of time like oh my god it's real seriously yes it's real but seriously is it real you know like that kind of thing but i don't know it it felt weird that we spent so much time on all this background info but then and you think like a build-up then then like you get all this info dumping and then you would get like a build-up to something like that's typically how movies work and it is like 15 minutes of info dumping which is a little uncomfortable but then literally the plot just starts and I do kind of appreciate that it's not trying to make things last longer than they need to but also it feels really stunted because there's not a real build up then Artemis's Fowl's dad is like captured kind I guess he's either captured or his plane never lands it we know he's captured like the audience knows he's captured Artemis knows he's captured because he gets a call from someone asking for a ransom but I don't know what the general public thinks. It's not really clear. I guess they think he just went missing. It's also unclear why they think he's a thief this whole time. I don't really know how the human element really works in this in this film. It's kind of a major plot hole. So Artemis gets this call from someone demanding a ransom and Butler, who the film calls Dom, and I'm going to call Butler because that's his name in the books, is is like, Artemis, I wasn't supposed to show you this, and bring them to, like, the secret lab room, which is cool. It's a very nice set. Um, 
But he doesn't really explain anything. He's just like, yeah, your family has been cataloging this stuff. And he's like, I don't really know anything. <laughs> it's kind of like the, the gist of it. He's like, I've either been cataloging this. But then, like, if you see a deleted scene lead, like, I watched the deleted scenes. And in the deleted scenes, he's like, I didn't really believe it. And it's like, but you, you said you've been work Like, your family and the Fowls have worked together. And you've, you helped Fowl Sr. Like, and you've seen all this stuff. Why wouldn't you believe it? Like, really? I don't know. And then they need to find, like, their his dad's journal, which they do in, like, less than a minute. It's really easy. Good for them. And then 20 minutes into the film, finally get to see the fairies and Haven City, which is, again, really visually appealing and really brings the book world to life in that way. And this is when we're introduced to Holly, who is the other protagonist. This is also where the movie really shifts its focus away from Artemis towards the fairies. I don't want to say it shifts it to any one particular fairy, but we start getting a lot of attention placed on Mulch and Holly and Root. Like, the story revolves around them, kind of, more than Artemis. Like, they, I feel like they get much more screen time than he does. Individually, each of them. I feel like they get much more screen time than Artemis Fowl himself actually does. They also have the more interesting aspects. Like, the movie focuses on, like, more of the intricacies of fairy society and like how the fairies are going to do things and like rescue holly from artemis more than they focus on how artemis actually gets ho gets holly or gets interested in fairies so anyway we find haven city we meet holly she's going to like a meeting she runs into mulch she's going to prison and then we get like a short scene where the person who is asking for a ransom i'm just gonna her name is Opal Kaboy. She uh, releases like a prisoner. We're not really sure what he did or or, or how she has the power because she it makes it sound like she did it like legally, like got him released, you know, through the proper channels. So she releases him and she's like, be my eyes and ears. And he's pretty, he's, I guess he does that <laughs> through the movie. So after the meeting, Holly talks to Root, played by Judy Dench. And she's like, I found a lead on my father. And you get the sense that like, Root and Holly's father were like close or something and Root's like likes Holly a lot which I do like their relationship I think it's nice I actually did really like how they played off of each other I think I think that was probably the best pairing in the movie like we got a lot of emotion there between them in a, like or I guess not a lot but more emotion between them than between anyone else I can all high but 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 Root's like no Holly don't you can't go up to the surface so then we flash back to Artemis kind of but then we're mostly focusing on Butler and it's like he realized he needed help so he brings in his niece, Juliet, who I think in the books is his sister. And she's Artemis' age, but she's, like, talented like Butler is, so that's cool. Uh, she has, like, nothing to do in the movie. I don't really know why they included her, except just to include her, which I appreciate that they tried, but they didn't try very hard. But then they didn't really try very hard with any of the characters, so not just her. So Artemis is doing, like, some hacking shit or, like, trying to figure stuff out. Whatever. Then we go back. It's such a small scene. And then we go back to... Holly and Root, they, they go to see Foley, who in the books is a really great character, really funny, and wears a tinfoil hat because he's paranoid about aliens. The movie gets rid of that, which is a shame. He's still a pretty cool character. I, I did like him. I thought they did him for a side character. They, they definitely lowered how much of a presence I feel like he had from the books, but like they did him well as a side character, and the actor did pretty well. Like I thought he was pretty solid in the role. He didn't need to emote that much, so it worked. While they're down talking to Foley, who's like the tech guy, they realize that um, there's like a, a troll on the loose up above, so they send Holly up because everyone else is busy. Oh, I didn't mention this, but there's like a MacGuffin that went missing because of course it did the Aculos. It's like a weapon, I guess. It's really unclear what it does. I guess it grants magic or something. It's so stupid. They never explain it fully. It's truly the MacGuffiniest MacGuffin. And all the other, like, leprechaun units are, which are, like, the police force or whatever, are, you know, looking for the Aculos. So Holly's the only one, so Root sends her up. And then we get a pretty long sequence of Holly fighting a troll. The sequence is definitely used to showcase what sort of technology the fairies have because they create a time bubble and they're able to erase humans' memories and all that. And also the troll does come back. So it is a scene that's like trying to seed itself for later, but it was just, I think, too long and not interesting. And then Holly is still up there and she's like, wait, I'm gonna go to, to Ireland because I have to see this thing about my dad. So she does. And Ruth's really upset. She's like, I'm gonna fire her. The Dover comes up again. 
Now, Artemis has this entire time been waiting for Holly to show up, I guess. It's really complicated. He, like, expects a fairy to show up, and he says she. So you're like, okay, so he expects Holly to show up because she showed up before, but it's implied that she's never been there before. And it's implied that the only fairy that his father would have had contact with was a he, which is Holly's father. Don't know what was going on there. It was a plot hole. But they wait for Holly... They shoot her with a dart, and they kidnap her. And then Root's like, fuck, we need to send everyone to rescue her, (laughs) which is great. They trap Holly. He schemes, but not really. He just talks about things that don't have to do with the scheme. And then the fairies arrive, and this is about the halfway point. Um, And this is, you know, part of the first novel. That's the plot. The fairies arrive to take down Artemis and rescue Holly, because he kidnaps her. That is the first novel. It's not really done this way, but, you know, it's done. There's, like, some fighting. It's okay. It's nothing special. Basically, Artemis is like, I need to bargain. So Root comes in, and they bargain, and he's like, look, I need the Aculos. I don't know why he's demanding the Aculos. He knows they don't have it, but okay. She calls in Mulch, who's in prison. She's like, we need your help. He's starting, like, a prison riot. I don't know why, he just likes to live dangerously. It doesn't tell us anything about his character. (laughs) Not at all. So he, uh, he's taken out of prison and he's like, yeah, I'll dig my way in because he's not bound by the same magical laws as fairies, which the movie doesn't explain at all. The books explain it nicely, the movie doesn't care. The movie's like, yeah, just so you know, there are laws, but you don't need to know what they are. And you just need to know that Mulch can break them. He's not bound by the same laws. So they get him to dig into the manor to get Holly, but Instead, he digs into the manor and finds, like, the safe where the Aculos is. And they all act as if this was what was supposed to happen. Like, Artemis is like, I knew this would happen. This was the plan. I don't know. I don't know. I, he there are easy. He probably could have just trapped a gnome or a whatever mulch is. I forget. <laughs> the dwarf, whatever. He, it's also so stupid. He unlocks the safe with his, like, nose hair. I'm not kidding. That happens. Artemis frees Holly because they're friends now. Because her dad is dead and... That makes them friends. It doesn't make any sense. And they get there just in time to see the Aculos. And Mulch doesn't care. He's like, ooh, the Aculos. And Holly doesn't care. And so Artemis takes it. Now, outside the manor, the guy who was, like, spying for Opal uh, is like, okay, Root, you're not in control anymore. Kicks her out. uh, Imprisons her. And he's like, we brought this troll (laughs) to kill them? Even though Opal expects Artemis to get her the the aculos like i don't know she wants the aculos it's what she wanted as you know in return for his father's safe return so you'd think oh she she wants she wouldn't want to kill artemis except i guess i can see she might want to kill him and take the aculos but i don't know it's really stupid the troll comes it's so much time fighting this troll it doesn't matter it's so chaotic it does like choreography is awful and then like butler gets hurt and they're like oh my god he's dying but you can't even care because you didn't really see him doing anything before this um you didn't get to see his relationship with artemis which in the books is very well written and complicated and you know butler is basically his father because in the books artemis his father has been missing for a long time and not just one one day or whatever uh butler is in large part responsible with raising and caring for him so then Butler's dying, and Holly doesn't have access to magic because they blocked it. So th- then they give her access to magic. I don't know, I guess they think she's in danger. So they give her access to magic, and then, like, she saves Butler. No big deal, everyone's happy. Awesome. Um, and then, so there was, like, a time bubble placed on them that Artemis broke uh, as, like, a bargaining chip, and it's breaking, so... Um, They all have to leave, but they're all okay with leaving because Holly's freed? I don't know what the goals were. They release the troll and then they're like, okay, we can go now. And then they make a big deal about how they all have to get out of there. It's dangerous with the thing breaking. And Root's like, Holly, you can't save the humans. But then the humans aren't even hurt. And then Holly goes back anyways and agrees to use the Aculos to bring Artemis' father back. Because I guess it works that way. And they do. And then father has a list of like names of traitors that Holly's father gave him. And so he goes, or he gives the list to Holly and Holly brings it to Root. And the Root is like, Holly, I want you to investigate it. And that's actually another cute scene. It, it parallels the scene earlier really nicely where they're talking to each other. 
and then I guess she goes to investigate it. We go back to Artemis and his dad, and then they go and break Mulch out of MI6 because the the master plan with Mulch being there and giving the interview was so he would tell the authorities about fairies and scare them, but they don't believe him. So I don't know why they would expect it to work. Even though he can like unhinge his jaw, I don't know if that's enough to make them believe in ever. you know? I don't know. It's unclear. They- so they break him out and they're like, okay good, now everything's taken care of. They know to leave us alone. And it's like, do they though? Do they know to leave you alone? Did this have to be a plot line? Why would the MI6 get involved with this? I don't- I get- like, they expect him to know where all these stolen things are, but they don't find anything out about that, and he gets out of there, and they don't really try to fight that either. And then, you know, we leave off with a shot of Butler, Artemis Sr. and Jr., Mulch, and Holly, and I guess Juliet's probably somewhere. They're all hanging out, and they're going on a mission, and it's like, what mission? I don't know, but they're going on a mission, probably to take out Opal Kaboy. Okay, well, that's the end. <laughs> like, there's no sequel happening, we know that. What what were your goals here? This movie was filmed like two years ago. <laughs> More. I don't ugh. Yep, that's the plot. It, that's as much sense as it can make. It, there's not really connective tissue, which is definitely where the movie fails. You don't really know why characters are acting certain ways or really what their connections are once things start to get complicated. By trying to combine two books together, they somehow ran out of story? which I think is why the troll scene takes up so much time. The pacing is way too quick. There are small moments here or there that I was like, okay, that's nice, but there were not enough of them to even sort of save the film. Visually, it's very appealing. The actors were all fine. I think they fit their roles really well. It's just that they were then having to act against one another that it failed. There was no chemistry or connection between really any of the actors, except like Holly and Root, I would say, had some. And uh, the actress who played Juliet, I thought she was genuinely warm whenever she was talking with anyone, but uh, she doesn't actually get much dialogue. And there's not much dialogue in the film. A lot of times it's just characters speaking at one another. I want to blame the editing because there are a lot of deleted scenes that help with some connective tissue, as well as a deleted scene that I know is like straight out of the book, but doesn't make any sense in the grander scheme of the film. So it's like if there, I feel like there was a lot cut out before they even got to filming from the script and then even more cut out after filming. So it, it just, it seems like a shredded film where you just get to see like clips that don't make sense next to one another. It works as a film, but just barely and definitely not a film worth rewatching. So how does it differ from the books and does it matter? Well, we'll circle back around to the does it matter thing, but First of all, no, I don't think an ad adaptation has to be the same as a book. I think there are a lot of successful adaptations that aren't, notably Shrek and How to Train Your Dragon. But I think there are also a lot of successful adaptations that are successful because they stay to the book. And a lot of unsuccessful adaptations that are unsuccessful because they deviated. But there's definitely room to be separate from the book and like, a broad way, but oftentimes you're adapting a book because you like the story, not because you're going to try to improve the story or change the story. I do also think that film and any art really, but a film adaptation should really be able to stand on its own as a film and not just as an adaptation, like going back to the Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. I don't think it's a bad film. I think that if you never read the Percy Jackson book, you could legitimately enjoy The Lightning Thief and that even if you have, you can watch it as a thing separate from the books. like an alternate universe Percy Jackson. And I think you can genuinely enjoy that film. All right, well, you definitely can't with, with Artemis Fall. It doesn't stand on its own. It doesn't hold its ground at all. How does it differ? Uh, it surprisingly follows the first book in pretty broad strokes. And plot points are actually carried over. It's just, and in the proper order. The like the troll fighting, the the whole like rescuing Holly, the like everything to do with the rescue of Holly, like the the, the plot is, is mostly the same. It's really the character motivations that differ. And that's probably the most frustrating part of it because it's the character motivations that guide the plot. And when you change what's making people do things, you're changing the plot at such a level that it, you have to be a really talented writer 
to be able to to justify that kind of change. Uh, right off the bat, the biggest motivation change is the, the fact that Artemis is working to save his father from being kidnapped and not the fact that he's fighting to save his mother who has kind of lost her mind. His motivation in the book is that he wants to kidnap a fairy so that he can ransom some gold and then he can use the gold to ask for a wish from the fairy so that he can heal his mother. And that's also, that's a pretty good motivation. His father in the first book is missing and that's, that's the plot of book two. So like, that's a big change in motivation. Holly's motivation in the movie likewise has changed. She wants to find answers about her own father, but there's nothing in the book. In the book, she's just above ground doing her job and she needs to replenish her magic, which is not even addressed in the movie, but she needs to replenish her magic. And Artemis just kidnaps her for no reason. Well, not for no reason, but no, like, it's not like her specifically. It's just a fairy and he comes across her. So they did try to, technically, they tried to ad adapt book two. Um, it's hard to tell because they got rid of everything about the plot, except they brought an opal cowboy and Artemis's father. And they changed Artemis's father's story a lot because he's been missing for a while and actually been kidnapped by the mafia in book two. That's the thing. And... Opal's whole story in book two is that she's basically an arms dealer. <laughs> not gonna, not gonna lie, she's an arms dealer for fairies, um, so she's a huge criminal. So they just kind of threw those characters in, I guess just to justify that they were using book two as well. And of course there's like small things that change between the, the book and the movie. The one that bothered me the most is the fact that they don't call Butler Butler, they call him by his first name, which in the books you have to like earn the right to do that. And it, like Artemis doesn't even call him by his first name until like book three or four or something like you have to earn the right to call butler dom or dom of Boy. his name is butler okay this bothered me so much uh, there's also the fact that artemis is wearing like regular clothing in the books it's like a big deal he dresses like fancy all the time like a businessman like a villain you know uh and i mean this uh, foley in the books wears a tinfoil hat because he's paranoid and they, I don't know, they got rid of that. I guess I can see why, because that would take like extra time to explain. But I mean, all these things, the butler thing really bothered me. I'm not going to call him Dom Foy. I'm going to call him butler, okay? That's part of the gimmick is we know he's not a butler. He's he's a bodyguard. He's like, a, he's like the, the badass bodyguard. It's, you know, the Alfred type character, except it's directly poking fun at that by calling him butler. I hate that the movie changed that so much. But everything to do with Artemis's father, too, is just different. Like, they, the Fowls run a criminal empire. That's like a thing. That's not debatable. Um, and I think the movie's trying to make it debatable. Uh, the characters are different from the books, obviously because of their motivation. But, like, v visually, so Butler and Juliet in the movie. Oh, actually, that's another little thing. In the book, Juliet is Butler's sister, not his niece. I don't know why they changed that. That one, that makes no sense. I don't know why they felt the need to change that. Like, okay, I guess. Uh, but like visually, Butler is in the books described as like Eurasian. I, he's supposed to be able to blend in anywhere. And they cast Nanzo Anansi, who is black. And I'm totally okay with that. I think that regard, like, I think it's a good change. I don't think it's anything that needs to be debated. And I think Nanzo Anansi did a good job being Butler, or as good a job as he could in the film. Like, besides being black, he fits the role, like, to a T. Like, that's how I picture Butler. And then, also, I mentioned Judy Dench plays Root, who in the books is a male character. And again, I think she fits the character to a T, besides being a woman. So, you know, I think those were both good decisions. And I think that they're not really made a big deal of. They just kind of put them in the role of the characters. And I think, you know, good job. Kudos, guys. And even though they did change motivations of characters a lot and small details, they, I think the spirit of the characters really do live on in the actors. I think that they, uh, you know, they did a good job with casting and yeah, they just, they got the energy of the characters correct, which I mean is good, but doesn't save this film at all. And then, so there's, oh God, the MacGuffin of the film is the Aculos. Still not sure what it does. I don't care. That does not exist in the books at all. Again, they just used it as motivation for Artemis and Opal and uh, did they need to? Really? I don't know. No. I do know. They didn't. Which brings us back to does it matter that they differed so much from the books? No. Again, I stick with that. I don't think it matters on a lot of ways. Uh, but I think it does matter in the fact that they weren't able to craft a coherent story on their own. They they're adapting a book and they don't even really use it as guidance. 
or I guess they use it as guidance, but such thin guidance. It, you can't even say it's inspired by the books. You just have to say it kind of feels like the movie was created by people who had never read the books and merely didn't even look at the Wikipedia page. The Wikipedia page is more cohesive than this film. So yeah, I think it does matter that it doesn't follow the books in that it's not a story. It's not, it's nonsensical. Top of the morning. All right, so I haven't looked at any reviews yet. I did a good job at staying away from them, but I absolutely cannot wait to read through the worst of them because I just need that catharsis. I need to feel seen. I need to know just how bad other people think it was and I'm looking forward to reading those reviews. I have to say. Does it make me horrible? I don't care. But yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed. I know this is a sort of an unconventional video. I Part of it was wanting to get it out. Part of it was like, I don't always want to show my face on video. And a large part of it is that my house is never fully quiet. Or not never, but almost never. And if I wanted to get this out relatively near its release date, I needed to do it sooner or later. Sooner than later. And so you have the audio like this. Thank you for sticking around. Do not forget to like and subscribe, especially if you want to see my reviews of later Disney Plus original releases. I believe the next one to come out is the Secret Society of Second Born Royals, and that's going to come out in July, if I am not mistaken. Uh, so pretty, um, well, lukewarm feeling about that one. <laughs> Hopefully it's better than Artemis Fowl. Bye V, bye everyone else. I'm going to go have lunch.